What I'm about to say is not a trick, and it's not an exaggeration. Jesus has a name that no one knows. In this video, I'm going to tell you that name. Now, you would think that publishing such a secret on the internet, and I might add that this name has been clearly stated in Scripture for almost 2,000 years, would end the secrecy. At least everyone who hears what I say in this video will know the secret. But so far, it hasn't worked like that, and I don't think it will this time either. You'll walk away and forget what the name is. A literally supernatural conspiracy to keep the name secret continues. Almost no one knows the name, even after it has been published many millions of times. Now let's back up a bit. If I were to address the congregations of a hundred different churches, give every member of the congregation a piece of paper and a pen, and ask them to tell me what they think I'm talking about when I tell them this secret name. I would not be at all surprised if no one, not one single person in all those churches, writes down that it's the name of Jesus. That should be evidence of how successfully the church as an institution has maintained this secret over the centuries, and how successfully they will continue to maintain it. You're probably thinking that I'm either talking about something obscure, like a weird Hebrew name for Jesus that no one has ever heard, or that I'm going to argue that something even weirder, like Ronald McDonald or some other name, is his real name. But no, I won't do either. Jesus' secret name, the name that no one knows, is clear and simple. I'll show you it right there in the Bible, and you will agree when you see it that it is both clear and at the same time, almost universally unknown. Most, if not all, of the experts in the churches will agree with me, even though they, too, will almost certainly not answer the question correctly. To top it off, the same passage that tells us that Jesus has a name which no one knows goes on to tell us exactly what that name is, right there in the same passage. A bit like saying, the combination to my safe is A, B, C, D, E, but no one knows it you yourself will walk away and forget it. In other words, you don't have to go looking for the secret name buried in the genealogies of some other obscure part of the Bible. Can you believe that? It's like the ultimate magic trick. God publishes the name in every Bible on earth, puts it right in front of your eyes, lets you see it and read it, tells you it's the secret name for Jesus, and then he goes on to guarantee that you will either refuse to believe it or you'll forget it. And why will you forget it? because there is a worldwide, supernatural, demonic conspiracy to keep anyone from hearing this name or passing it on. I myself have had to pray seriously about what it is going to cost me personally to point this out to you. You who are hopefully my friends, just mentioning this name in its true context can get me shunned from many, many churches. So, are you ready for it? Do you want me to read it out? Can we have a drum roll, please? It comes from the Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 to 13. I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. He that sat upon it was called Faithful and True. No, that's not the name, but good for you for spotting it. This is just saying that everyone says Jesus is faithful and true, we praise him for coming to give us this truth, but still we hide his name. You'll see. Let's read on. In righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. All of this is by way of introduction. We're reminded that Jesus is everything he claimed to be, infallibly righteous, powerful beyond measure. Ultimately, he's going to judge the whole world. We have a lot of creeds which say these sort of things. And yet... We insult him over and over by trying to rob him of his true name and his true authority. So, here it comes. He had a name written that no one knew except he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name, wait for it, is called, here it is, 
the word of God. Do you see it? Was I exaggerating? If I had asked you, without all of this introduction, what is the word of God to you? Would you have answered Jesus' secret name? No, of course not. The phrase, Word of God, is used over and over, almost monotonously, in churches all over the world every week. But almost never is it used properly. That is, to refer to Jesus, the rightful owner of that title. So what is it that they are referring to when they use that term? And why are they using it in that way? Please note that the Bible itself never says that it is the Word of God. The Bible as we know it did not even exist at the time that this passage or any other passage in it was first written. The Bible came together at various big conferences and various major church denominations many years after the final books were written. Some scriptures were included, some were excluded, and a few were accepted by some and rejected by others. The Bible is a wonderful book, and I'm sure that God has played a very important part in preserving it for us today. Certainly in Bible times, there was a lot of interest in the holy writings that now comprise the Old Testament. However, the term, Word of God, even in the Old Testament, before Jesus was born, simply referred to God's voice in what Every way he chose to speak to us. Certainly God spoke, albeit imperfectly, through great men of the Old Testament. But the New Testament tells us that the Old Testament was imperfect. It says, we have a more reliable or more sure word of prophecy. And it refers to this more reliable word as the day star which is born in our hearts. Who is this day star? The Bible says the law, that is the first five books of the Old Testament, came through Moses. But grace and truth, ultimate truth, perfect truth, infallible truth, the literal Word of God, came through Jesus Christ. The New Testament tells us what, or more correctly, who the voice of God is. In its purest form, it sets straight everyone who had only read the Old Testament up to that time. It tells us very clearly who the Word of God is. Read it in the first chapter of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now can you substitute Bible for Word in that passage? Let's try it. In the beginning was the Bible, and the Bible was with God, and the Bible was God. You see how insulting it is to use the name of God and the name of Jesus for a book. No matter how great the book is, and no matter how inspired its various contributors were, it's still just a book by comparison to the Word of God, the all-powerful one who created the universe. Read on. All things were made by the Bible, and without the Bible was not anything made that was made. No, 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 of course not. The Bible did not make everything. The Bible itself was made with help from God, but also with help from fallible human beings. They wrote it, and they voted on which bits to leave in and which ones to leave out. So why do people insist on calling the Bible the Word of God? Or more important, why do they insist on not calling Jesus the Word of God? If you listen long enough, you'll gradually discover that it has to do with trying to make every other word in that book equal to what Jesus, the true Word of God, has revealed to us through His teachings. If you can convince people that what Jesus said is in no way superior to anything else said in that book, then you can use almost anything else to argue against the stuff that Jesus actually taught. And that is exactly what they do. John says, The Word was made flesh, and He dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the Son of God. He came to His own people, 
but they would not receive him. Nevertheless, if anyone will receive him, he will give them the power to become sons of God. And John was obviously talking about Jesus. So the passage I quoted from the Revelation is not an isolated passage. John, too, says that Jesus is the Word of God. But is anyone listening? Or to put it more scripturally, is anyone receiving Jesus by obeying and teaching what he taught? People in churches all over the world say, Lord, Lord. They claim to have received Jesus as their Savior. But the moment you suggest that he alone is the Word of God, they object. They act like it gives Jesus too much power. Consequently, despite their claims to having received Jesus, they have actually rejected him. When you recognize Jesus himself as the Word of God, it takes power away from those modern-day Pharisees. They have for centuries been using the Apostle Paul or Solomon or Moses or just about anyone else in this rather large book to build various doctrines that have little or nothing to do with anything that Jesus said. And they will say that these doctrines are equally reliable as anything that Jesus ever said. They write volumes on the significance of every Jewish festival and every aspect of the Jewish temple. They lecture on women being in submission to men, teach stuff Paul said about works and grace, biblical injunctions against homosexuality, tattoos and horoscopes, teachings about not smoking, drinking, or using four-letter words. But the teachings of Jesus, well, they just never quite get around to them. The most common reaction I get when I say something like this is, but, 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 but if you take away the Bible, how will I know what's right and what's wrong? The Bible is the standard we use to know God's will. Well, first, I'm not taking away the Bible. In fact, I'm actually promoting the Bible. And second, people are not using it as a standard for right and wrong anyway. It's just that it's harder to spot the deception in what they're doing when you make every single verse in the whole Bible including genealogies, the numbering of various tribes, and stuff about women having long hair, equal to anything that Jesus taught. How many of us could ever master all the thousands of chapters of writings spread over thousands of years to find the precise truth that God most wants us to know from those 66 books of the Protestant Bible? And every one of the 62 books, aside from the four Gospels, has been used at times to contradict or distract people from the teachings of Jesus in those Gospels. There are more doctrinal disputes per person amongst those who claim that the Bible is infallible than there are per person in less rigid denominations. In other words, belief in the infallibility of the Bible has not made it easier to arrive at the truth, every one of those so-called infallible Bible theologians has to close their minds to certain passages of Scripture or to rewrite them in order to suit their own interpretations. So both sides of almost any doctrinal argument quote verses from the Bible, but they also ignore or argue against the verses quoted by the other side. Both sides say they are preaching the Word of God, and their opponents are not. This is because there is no single standard, just a very big book full of a lot of things that can be used to supposedly prove almost anything. There are understandable arguments that people will raise to what I've said, but what I most want to emphasize here is what this teaching has done with regard to Jesus and his claim on our lives. That's the real issue. Jesus, whom we would all have to acknowledge, is God's ultimate revelation to mankind, has, through the so-called perfect Bible teaching, been relegated to a level on par with everything else in the Bible. In reality, it's much worse than that, because whenever anyone else in the Bible can be seen as saying something apparently contradicting what Jesus taught, people will claim that it's just fine to go with what the other person said as long as that person is one of the contributors to the Bible. For example, Jesus said, 
call no man on earth father. Then Paul says to Timothy that Timothy is like a spiritual son to him. Conclusion? It's okay to call your spiritual leader's father. Why? Well, because Paul did. Now this is just one of hundreds of tricks they do to cancel out everything that Jesus said. Whereas I would say that you have two choices. One is that you make Jesus true and everyone else a liar. That is, you conclude that it doesn't matter one little bit what Paul did if it is contrary to what Jesus taught. And the other choice is that we can conclude that what the other Bible writer has done or said has simply been misunderstood or misinterpreted. No matter how fundamental the writings of the apostles and the prophets are, the Bible says that Jesus is the cornerstone. Not Paul, not Moses, not Solomon or Peter. Jesus predicted that he would be brushed aside by the religious builders every time a contradiction appeared between what he said and what someone else said. Isn't that exactly what has happened? Of course, the teaching that makes it all legitimate is the teaching that Paul, Moses, Solomon, Peter, Jeremiah, Amos, Ruth, King David, all of them are equal to Jesus. How else could we justify, for example, all the wars that have been waged in the name of Christianity? The loving Son of God told us to love our enemies, yet we have the Old Testament full of people wreaking havoc on enemy nations. So, who has to take the back seat? Jesus, of course. If you go through everything that Jesus taught, you'll find how consistent this observation is. Over and over, we are told that we must, quote, balance what he taught with what other Bible writers taught. And in the end, Jesus gets sidelined. Even with things like love. Jesus said, love one another as I've loved you. How did he love us? He left everything. He spent his whole life sharing his love with people. And then he died a torturous death for us. His immediate followers understood what he was saying. They took up their crosses and literally followed him. But is that the kind of love that you see in the church today? No way. Oh, there's nice smiles and token donations, usually in situations where we make sure others know what we're doing, which is also contrary to what Jesus taught. But in the end, you go your way and I'm left to go mine. Love itself is very superficial. Basically, in almost any church today, it's everyone for themselves. Now let's be very clear. I definitely believe the Bible. If it says that it is inspired, I believe it. If it says that it is useful for teaching doctrine, I believe it. And if it says that Jesus himself is the infallible word of God, then I believe that too. The claim that the Bible is infallible and in every single word is not taught by the Bible. Nevertheless, this tradition suits the pharisaical fundamentalists who think that they need to only produce one obscure verse to support anything they want to teach. And if they hammer and twist that proof text long enough, then everyone will have to submit to their superior knowledge and authority. Isn't it what they've done even with the name of the Bible? In many circles, you are hardly ever hear it referred to as the Bible anymore. I'm going to read from the Word of God this morning. Open the Word of God to Zephaniah chapter 2. Let's listen to what the Word of God has to say about such and such. Well, it's all right there in the Word of God. It's not an exaggeration, is it? They hammer it and hammer it and hammer it, but it does not make it true. It's not the Word of God. Jesus is the Word of God. And the evidence for that claim actually comes from the Bible itself. If you really believe the Bible, then you must agree that everything I have said so far in this video is consistent with what the Bible teaches. But who wants to believe that? If we made the teachings of Jesus the standard by which to judge everything else that is recorded in the Bible, all of the elaborate doctrines that pour out of the mouths of hundreds of thousands of preachers every Sunday morning would be shown up for what they are, mere diversions from the things that Jesus actually said. Brothers and sisters, the final showdown is looming. 
We need to question our most cherished traditions right now. Jesus said, In the last days, the words that I have spoken will judge you. We're living in the last days right now, and I'm trying to get you to listen to the Word of God today, now, before it comes crashing down on you and grinds you to powder very soon. Are you prepared to take the time to read some of the things that Jesus said and to test yourself on this? Please listen to other videos on this channel. You may be surprised at what you will hear. And if you haven't subscribed already, please do so now, including a click on that little bell so that you can be notified as more information becomes available. Act now before this channel gets shut down for preaching such things. Thank you.